1. I was living in Newfoundland, Canada, and had just graduated high school in 2001. The following fall, I went to university and was spending some time in a student lounge with a few classmates. One of the guys started yelling at the TV in the corner and calling out to anybody around to come close. It was the first plane crash for 9-11. Over the next few days, St. John's and Gander, Newfoundland became a haven for passengers who were stranded when their flights were grounded. Some of you might have heard of the Broadway show Come From Away. My old high school was turned into an emergency shelter for multiple flights. The classrooms, theater, gym, and cafeteria were all set up to receive hundreds of people. If you've ever met a Newfoundlander, we are generally considered pretty generous and welcoming people. When the call-out for volunteers happened, my high school had almost as many volunteers as there were stranded passengers. I was one of those willing to help. Despite the horrible reason for the gathering, I had a lot of fun. Got to play some chess with these Eastern Orthodox gem traders, chatted about French cuisine with a Parisian chef, watched the news in the theatre with people from all over the world. Almost everyone was very appreciative. We all bent over backwards to make sure everyone had everything they needed. It was a tough situation, but we were trying to make the best of it. Almost. This one American couple from Alabama started making trouble for whichever volunteer they could corner. The cots and blankets we had provided weren't good enough for them. They demanded their own room, and when we couldn't accommodate, they insisted we pay for a hotel room for them. The free food we had offered wasn't good enough, and they would grab a box, open it, and immediately throw it in the trash. I was there for quite a few hours, and after lunch, I decided to pop outside for a bad habit. I've been a smoker for a while, early days back then. I'm trying to quit now. Mrs. Alabama catches my eye outside the school and struts up demanding a cigarette. I'm pretty easy going about it and I offer her two, one for later. She lights one up, drops them both on the ground and steps on them. I'm a little shocked, but even more so when she looks at me and says, Listen here, buddy, you aren't leaving here today unless you find me a pack of menthols. I laughed at her, and told her that there was a corner store down the street. Nerve of some people. Can't tell if this is entitled to choosing beggar, but likely both. Two. So this is a story from my former place of work. For privacy, I won't say in what business, but let's say we have to work with people. This guy, gay, drank nine beers on the job one day. Beers complimentary for guests. Three other employees told him that it's absolutely not cool and doesn't look good for the sake of the business. It can jeopardize the image of the jobs of other people. A week or so after, he also downed nearly half of a 24-ounce or so bottle of whiskey that was complimentary for guests, of course meant to be served over time. He replaced it, then the next day drank the replacement on the job, replaced it again and drank it again. The last time it happened, I poured it out in the alley. It was about a $15 bottle of booze. He asked where it had gone and I told him straight up, it's not cool for you to down multiple bottles at work, so he accepted that. Fast forward to about two weeks later. He is drinking beer again in the back. I ask, hey man, do you at least have some gum or mints? No, I don't. Why? Because getting drunk at work can make us all look really bad. He didn't care. Fast forward again to a meeting. We were encouraging workers to be on their stuff, make good money, everyone wins, etc. And that's when I got appointed a new manager. Mr. Drunk Pants, who was tipsy from the bar where he went after work to the time of the meeting, gets sassy. He is slurring speech from booze and says, I can tell they wanted you to be manager. You go around cleaning things. And your personality is just so... That's when everyone present says, What? He replies, So... Another employee interjects. If you're gonna say it, you better be able to explain. Your personality is so big dick. You also seem so uppity, it's too much. 
The other employees disagreed and said that I'm always working hard. The workers really liked working with me. The owner didn't want anyone singled out, didn't want anyone to be critical, but instead be positive, encouraging, etc. He didn't mind that I got singled out. We were going over what we wanted employees to do for the sake of everyone. Kay exclaimed that the rules are fucking stupid and nothing matters. He doesn't like rules. Mind you, this is an adult over the age of 30. A few days later, I'm talking with the owner and I confronted him about not wanting to single anyone out, etc. But he doesn't mind when I get singled out. He tells me my tone of voice isn't always great. I'm monotone. I tell him, yeah, it's not always great, but do you see me yelling at people? Swearing? There was nothing abusive about what I said to Kay. I just told him it wasn't cool to get wasted. I said it in a serious tone, but not shouting or degrading. I said, I didn't think it was so nice for Kay to down bottles and say any rule and protocol is fucking stupid and he won't listen. That sounds pretty uppity to me. The owner says, that's not how it is. He felt bullied when you asked him if he has gum or mints. Yeah, I didn't bully. Seems like he wants attention off of him and is trying to make me look like an ass because I told him it's not cool to get wasted. The owner didn't want to have any sweat or stress in this situation for the sake of making money. 3. This happened a while ago, but I started to remember how absolutely crazy this situation was, so I figured I'd share it with you. This happened when I was working as one of the desk ladies in the leasing office of an apartment complex. An important thing to know about our area is that we're a college town with not enough housing, so rent rates all over town got artificially inflated and affordable homes were in short supply. Many folks were forced to move to neighboring towns to find a place, but that wasn't an option for everyone. Our complex was one of the few complexes that retained somewhat affordable rates, which meant we were in high demand. We had a waiting list pushed all the way into the next year, our leasing season was based on school semesters, like most places in town. Every year we would open up leasing for next year around September, and we'd be full up by next year somewhere between December through March. So if we filled up the waitlist by December 2018, and you came in around January 2019 looking for a place, you'd have to go on the next waiting list for a place with a move-in date of 2020. With that in mind, we had to turn a lot of people looking for an immediate move-in away. But we hated to have people leave empty-handed, so we did regular market surveys to keep on top of local availability. That way, even though we couldn't give people an apartment with us, we could at least send them off with a list of local properties that did have availability. So they wouldn't have to drive to every single property in a 30-mile radius. Anyway, that brings us to Entitled Elderly Lady, who will henceforth be known as Eel. She came in around March or April of 2016 looking for an immediate move-in. Here's how it went. Welcome to XYZ Property. How can I help you today? She sits down. Yes, I am looking for an apartment. Can I fill out an application? We might be able to help you out there. When are you looking to move in? As soon as possible, please. Aw, oh, shucks. Unfortunately, we're all leased up until next summer, but I'd be happy to take your application and add it to our waitlist for next year. I don't want an apartment next year, I want one now. I getcha, no problem. Although we don't have availability, here's a complete list of all the properties in town that have immediate availability. If you like one of them, I'd be happy to call over so they can know to expect your visit. No, no, I don't want to live at any of those, I want to live here. Those are all too expensive. Oh, I see. No problem. What is your budget? I can expand my search to include properties in neighboring towns. You'll find a few more affordable options that way. She gave me her budget and then said, But I'm not leaving town. It has to be here. I see. Well, I'm really sorry, but the only properties with current availability in this town are going to be the ones on this list here. So you don't even have one single apartment for me? Not a single one? I don't believe you. Ma'am... Why would I lie to you about this? As a business, doesn't it make sense that we'd want to rent apartments? If I had something for you, don't you think I'd like to rent it to you? I don't know why you people do the things you do. 
Prove to me that you have no apartments. You know what? Sure. I pull up her system and pull a leasing inquiry. No private resident information or apartment numbers were visible. The computer display says available apartment zero. Okay, well, when is one available? I type in another query. The computer display said 5-12-2017, next year, like I said. Now, just to clarify, that's the earliest lease beginning date for next year, but if the resident on that lease renews, that one won't be available either, and we'd have to go to whatever the next one is. She's starting to understand her situation. So, what are you going to do for me? Ma'am, I have given you the options that are available for you. It's up to you to choose from those options. That's not good enough. Can't you just boot somebody? What? I guarantee they don't need the apartment as much as I do. I visibly recoiled when she said this. I was clutching my pearls a little bit. Ma'am, it is illegal to evict someone without cause. I need a place to live. Isn't that cause enough? Ma'am, everyone needs a place to live. And I'm not going to evict some innocent resident just because you don't want to move out of town. This was probably insensitive of me. Not everyone has the ability to travel between towns, but I was done with this lady. She paused for a minute and just stared at me. So what can you do for me? Now on my last shred of patience I say, What would you like me to do? Build you an apartment? She just froze and stared at me in shock, so I continued a little more calmly. Ma'am, I can't give you what I don't have. You're going to have to look elsewhere. I have given you several alternatives. You'll just have to pick one. As she walks out, she mutters, Unbelievable. Of all the years I was at that job, I had only ever had one person ask me to evict someone so they could have their apartment. Also, most people were grateful for that extra step we took in trying to help them find a place, even if it wasn't with us. We'd even sit with them and go over the rent rates and floor plans of our competitors to help people find a place, but she didn't give me a chance to get that far. I get it. Living with a housing shortage is rough. I couldn't afford to live in town either. I had to commute. But don't hassle the girl at the front desk who can't solve the shortage for you. 4. So, I have severe heart problems. They are hereditary, and they are in both my blood-related family and my step-family. So we consider them more seriously than doctors. We watch what we eat, our blood pressure, cholesterol levels, glucose levels, etc. On to today's event. I went to the clinic after experiencing some painful chest pain, nausea, and a loss of feeling in my right pinky finger. Before I was seen, an older woman sat next to me. She glanced at my sheet I was filling out and scoffed. I side-eyed her and asked if she was okay. A little information. The hospital requires you to wear a mask in the waiting room since there is limited seating and not a lot of room to stay away from others. While COVID spreads are all very well controlled, they worry more about something common being spread to someone whose body doesn't have a good immune system. This woman, I'll call her Kate, sat right next to me, had no mask on, and symptoms of a cold. When I asked her if she was okay, she scoffed and said I was too young to have so many problems. I was filling out the medical history portion of my sheet. I looked down and kind of chuckled to myself and said, yes, well, it didn't stop my grandma from having a heart attack at 52 years, or my biological father from a heart condition-related stroke at 23. Kate looked like a shocked Pikachu meme. You're lying. There's no such thing as a 50-year-old having a heart attack. And your father probably lied about his stroke. This is the problem with today's generation. I hope you don't teach your babies to lie. I did a thing. Well, my mother had to drag him to the ER, so I'm pretty sure his stroke happened, and I watched my grandmother have her heart attack, and I called the ambulance for her. There are records for both individuals and what happened. But maybe you're a doctor. Is that why you're coughing in my face and sitting next to me when there is plenty of seating? Oh, and my boyfriend doesn't want kids yet, so we both practice safe fun. But I'll be sure to let my cats know that I'm a liar for a genetic disorder that they will never get. When my name got called, I looked back at her before going through the doors and said, Thank you for your insight, Dr. Kate. 
but I prefer people who have degrees telling me what's possible with my heart and what is not. I hope you have a great day. The nurse looked at us and said she didn't know there was a doctor in the waiting room. Kate just sat in her seat and mean-mugged me until the doors closed. I was raised to respect people's boundaries, and if you have to sit by someone filling out important paperwork, you look away and say nothing. I don't look at other people signing anything, and if possible, I will always put at least a chair between me and someone else because I worry that what I could have could be worse for them. I cough a lot when I get chest pain, and I would be so upset if I got my saliva on someone else and they get more sick than when they went in. I'm okay now, three weeks bad rest, but I can't understand why she sat next to me and was arguing about my medical history. 5. About 12 years ago, I worked in security for a high-end resort. It was a small group, and the head of security was a retired police sergeant. He was actually pretty cool and had a really strong sense of right and wrong. We had a fridge in the back, and I would buy things like juice for when I had low blood sugar, type 1 diabetic, and snacks to keep my sugar from bottoming out since I walked 5 to 6 miles per shift. My juice disappeared. I replaced it and the same thing happened again. I got another and wrote on it that I don't use cups and I have mouth herpes, I don't. It disappeared again. We all had an idea who it was, but couldn't ever catch him. Until I walked in one day and saw the first shift guy making a meal out of my food. I asked him point blank what he was doing eating my food and he said, That's what you get for being late. I checked the clock and I was two minutes late. He even took food out of my locker and was snacking on my glucose tabs because they taste like candy. Somehow, the head of the department found out what he said and called me in to ask me about it. Seems this dude had been stealing food from the fridge since he started there, and while people weren't happy about it, they were willing to let it go, since a lot of people brought food in and thought of it as community property. This didn't apply to me because they viewed my food as medically necessary and this was the first time he went into someone's locker. My boss said this would be handled and dismissed me. When I came in for my next shift, all of this guy's stuff was gone and his locker was empty. My mom also worked there at the time and I found out that because this guy served in Iraq, he felt like everyone owed him. He would constantly come in late to work, pawn his work off on other people, and was the only one who didn't contribute to the communal fridge. If you needed to type up an incident report, you had to wait for him to finish browsing the internet on the office computer. We only had one at the time. I ran into him about six months later, after he was let go. I was doing laundry, and right as I was approaching the big machine, I was doing mine and my then-boyfriend's laundry. He jumped in front of me and took it. This guy might be the most entitled piece of shit I've ever encountered. I told my mom about this post, and there was more that happened before I started. I normally wouldn't have added anything because it was already more than enough, but this latest info was straight WTF. I guess he used to bring his enormous husky into the office with him, but the boss said he couldn't do that. Okay, the dog isn't in the office anymore, but less than a few hours later, the office received a report about a dog locked in a car. He left his dog in the car. WT, actual F. I have two dogs, one we rescued just last December, and he's 12. I won't even leave him outside in the sun too long, even though he loves to sunbathe because he's my baby. When my boss pretty much asked him, WTF, and said he can't do that, it's cruel, the guy said he wanted his dog near him, but was told he couldn't bring him to work. Again, WTAF. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Idiots in the Wild, episode 129. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Before you go, I'd appreciate it if you click that like button. Or like that click button. Just that, that, that button. It's like a thumbs up. Anyway, uh, if you'd like to get the videos a little bit early, then you can support me through Patreon for as little or as much as you like a month. That is linked in the description. And you'll also find a link to the Hellfreezer Teespring store in the description there. And if you like, on a one-off basis, you can make donations during streams or videos like this one. And while this isn't required, it does help keep the lights on around here. 
Lights are good. Let me see what I'm doing. Alrighty, now I don't think there's any other business, so let's move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is for all you smoothie lovers out there. Uh, I've finally gotten up off my lazy butt because I need to eat a lot. And I, I need to eat healthier. It's not even a matter of I want to, I just I really need to. Uh, so I'm back on the smoothie train. I was buying them from, from the local uh, Lidl. And they're very nice ones, and I quite like. Not super expensive either. But at the end of the day, you're probably going to get more sugar in one you buy from a store than you are from one you make yourself. So I've been making my own. Uh, quite like, you know, just a simple apple, banana, and maybe some kale in there. You know, a little bit of green. Uh, some oat milk I generally put in there. Although I might put a little splash of apple juice in there just to be adventurous. Uh, but uh, let me know what you think. Uh, those of you who do enjoy smoothies... Uh, do you have a favorite recipe? Something that you, you, your go-to? I did finally get around to buying ginger again because there's like a splash of ginger in there. And I will need to buy more honey because the honey that I had, although honey never goes off as we all know, honey doesn't actually go off, but what I had mysteriously disappeared. It was almost finished though. Uh, so I'll have to find a, a new brand of honey because the one I used to get, I would get from Amazon. It was a good sized jar. I only had to really buy one a year. Uh, very expensive, that's why I only had to buy one a year. Uh, but they don't sell the brand I liked anymore, which makes me sad. So I'll have to find another brand of, uh, I think it was Acacia Honey. I think that's how you pronounce that. Anyway, I'm going to shut up for now and head off. So until next time, thank you very much for listening. And take very good care of yourselves. <laughs>